Center for Theories in Historical Research and the uh, Area Cultures of History. I would like to welcome everyone to our fourth Domino Talk and a uh, special welcome to our guests, um, Ethan Clamber from Wesleyan University and Christian Marta from Bielefeld University. Uh, before we start, I would like to say some words um, about the format talk, uh, Domino Talk series. Uh, in the context of our interest, theories in historical research, the game of dominoes represents a theoretical topic that brings two scholars together, like two different domino pieces. At the center of the exchange is a recent publication, publication that focuses on theoretical questions to be discussed from two points of view. The author presents her his book, to which an expert gives a commentary. This theory game is carried over in the following semesters. The same author is once again invited to the Center um, of Theories and Historical Research this time as an expert to discuss a new publication with her, his author. Two semesters ago, Achim Lanthe discussed with Ethan Kleinberg his book, Emmanuel Levinas, Talmudic Turn. And now it is Ethan's turn to discuss with Christian Wachter his books, Geschichte Digital Schreiben, Hypertext as Nonlineare Wissensrepräsentation in der Dig Digital History, published by Transpit 2021. And here is the real book. <laughs> <laughs> the domino matching value of this talk is a theoretical reflection on nonlinear and multiple forms of narration with historiography. So, some words um, about Christian. Since 2022, uh, Christian Wachta is a postdoctoral research associate in digital his history at Bielefeld University. He studied history and philosophy at the University of Hamburg and Göttingen. In Göttingen, he worked as a research uh, assistant at the Center for Digital Humanities and then at the Center for Theory and Culture and Society. His last position before he reached us was as a postdoctoral research associate at the Chair of Theory and Methods of History. And the book we want to discuss tonight is a revised PhD thesis in uh, modern history. Ethan Kleinberg is class of 1958, distinguished professor of history and letters at Wesleyan University. It's a mouthful. <laughs> a lot of words. And editor in chief of the leading journal History and Theory. He's well known in Bielefeld. In 2021, he was the recipient of the Ranat Kozelek visiting professorship and spent two months at our university where he hosted a seminar for students workshop for doctoral uh, candidates and gave a public lecture. During his residence, he worked on a book project titled Temporal Anarchy in History, which could be considered the last part of a trilogy dedicated to the question how to represent the haunting forces from the past that press upon us and then are not accessible. <coughs> The first part of this trilogy is the book Hunting History for a Deconstructive Approach to the Past, published in 2017. And the second one, Emmanuel Levinas' Talmudic Turn, published in 2021, and he's being presented here on the uh, third domino talk. So, um, Christian, we are very keen to hear your um, thoughts and thesis um, and the presentation of your book and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and uh, looking very much forward to uh, the discussion with Ethan and with you. Um, I think I have to switch the presentation first. Now, here we go. Yes, so uh, I was told to present in about 15 minutes uh, at least the main ideas and the motivation for my book. 
and uh, to give you a, a brief outline of the main ideas, um, I um, present to you this, this arrow-like structure that uh, is supposed to represent my line of argumentation, basically. And I want to start with uh, a fairly um, uncontroversial and uh, um, basic observation that media are not only channels that transmit uh, messages from a sender to a receiver uh, in a neutral way in this uh, old Shannon Weaver uh, model uh, notion, but uh, that media themselves have impact on the messages that are to be transmitted. And uh, this is basically or primarily what I want to stress here due to two factors, culture, so we are culturally conditioned. Uh, we know how to write scientific texts or scholarly texts uh, that have to have an introduction, main part and end part. We uh, know how to read other texts. So we have this like cultural um, um, conditioning of um, perceiving media artifacts or media products on the one hand. And the other thing is materiality in a, in a broad sense. That means uh, mat the material and also the form, the appearance of media products shape our perception, right? So the, the slide you can see here uh, presents you an overview. And if I would not have the slide, I would have to consecutively explain to you what is the outline of my um, of my um, argumentation, which would work as well, of course, but uh, is, is a different uh, uh, thing to present to you and a different perception that uh, you receive. So this is, uh, these are two features that shape the how or the way of perception. And this is a, the, the notion of aesthetics that goes back to the old Greek aesthetikos, uh, which does not mean the beauty or the beautiful, but the way we perceive uh, things. And this is the, the, the venture point I have for my, um, for my book, uh, for the argumentation, um, that we all use media in a broad sense. Also my presentation is medial, or multimodal, uh, multimodal actually, because I'm using the presentation. So we have to use media to um, communicate, to transmit information messages, but these media shape our perception. And different media products do that in different ways and give us different impressions. Um, witnessing a live broadcast of a sports event, for instance, uh, is much more Im immersive for instance, than reading a description or a report on that event, right? So you have these different media and you have different um, ways or, ha or modes of perception that are evoked. And if we accept this observation, then we should ask ourselves, which media should we use for which situation or communication interest? Because it would not make sense to present to you a scientific or a scholarly uh, work uh, as a, um, a, a voice recording because the text by its mediality is much more suited to um, let you read along the steps of my argumentation and um, the overall demonstration to repeat certain readings, to skip to other ones, and so on. So this is due to the typographic, the textual mediality of the book or the monography. And to put it in a, in a, in a nutshell, this is about how to um, translate knowledge design, the way we shape knowledge that we want to communicate into a appropriate media design. So, so this is the motto, so to speak, of, of the whole endeavor of this book. And for history and, and other uh, humanities, of course, our reference medium is the typographical, the printed text, or text 
that mimics the printed text in an electronic form, but still is like the typographical text. And this is no coincidence, of course, because as I said, uh, the printed texts and um, uh, books that are structured along sections, main chapter sections, give you an impression about the logical structure of, of the whole demonstration. So uh, I would argue, and <coughs> this is not my, my idea, uh, of course, but uh, I want to stress here that a table of contents, for instance, is not just a table of contents, but it's a device to access the logical structure of a, of a work, right? So why now hypertext? Um, hypertext has been brought into play as an extended or generalized form of writing. And this definition goes back to Ted Nelson, who uh, invented the term hypertext. Ted Nelson is the third in the row of the founding trinity of hypertext. Um, um, this is what how, how uh, Michael Joyce, a uh, pioneering uh, hyperfiction scholar and literary scholar, uh, uh, phrased it. Um, so first came Veneva Bush, uh, who was the head of the Office of Scientific Research and Development in the Second World War, and had a huge collective of scientists working together. And when this institution dissembled, he observed that all the knowledge that was there in this group, in this great collective, um, is threatened to be lost. And he wanted to keep all that knowledge. So he, he thought of a machine or a device that could keep track of all that knowledge. And he invented a, or conceptualized, he never actually uh, put it into implementation, but he conceptualized a machine uh, working with microfilm and uh, microfiche and um, displays that is some kind of Wikipedia, as we could call it today. So nodes or chunks of information that are stored in, in something like a database and that can be retrieved um, individually and connected to each other individually as well. So that this is what you actually all do probably when browsing through the Wikipedia, finding these trails and paths uh, um, that can be stored in this uh, machine called Memex. And this idea inspired uh, the second of the Trinity, uh, Douglas Engelbart, who in the 60s actually invented the first hypertext. So it, it was a technical device to support um, people to, uh, to um, untangle difficult problems and to to find a solution in uh, complicated constructions and argumentations uh, in his augment um, project. Um, and what he had in mind is to augment the human intellect with this machine. And the third in, in this uh, row is Ted Nelson, as I have already mentioned him, who, um, who wrote about the Xanadu project, which is uh, some kind of World Wide Web before the World Wide Web. So he was the original um, uh, visionary of, of what we now today know as the World Wide Web, connecting literature, connecting texts or pages uh, in a hypertextual fashion. And this gives you a first impression of what hypertext actually is, um, namely what you can see on the left side. Um, this is, is a schematic overview. <coughs> chunks of information that could be uh, textual chunks, pages, or video clips, anything. But chunks of information that are interlinked and form a network-like structure. This structure is not finished by definition, it can grow, and users may choose entries and turnings uh, by navigating through this web. Hypertext is also something, and this is what I'm basically arguing in this book, um, something that could be conceptualized like uh, the structure as you can see it on the right side, hand side, a multimodal and multilinear structure that um, is 
not like this is not like a, a network, but a, a branching um, structure of preset paths um, that could be followed only in the direction as the um, as the creators of that hypertext uh, have um, defined it. So hypertext is some kind of, I would say, outfashioned term for this <laughs> um, sort of information architecture, to put it in a, in, a, in a broad sense. But as a conceptual term, I would like to keep it, and I kept it here in my uh, book, because it's, uh, it's a term that a lot of theory and um, concepts have been developed um, that nowadays um, are um, addressed as interactive literature or the World Wide Web and other sorts of interlinked information. So what can we do with this uh, kind of information architecture or this extended text which underlines the notion of text that is stripped from this barriers of uh, printed lines that only go in one direction and not in all directions. So, um, and the answer is for, for many projects, many initiatives, it has been multi-perspectivity, to employ multi-perspectivity on um, different issues. And I brought to you um, several um, examples that I won't discuss, of course, in detail, but um, that should highlight um, that Multi-perspectivity and its imp implementation by hypertext has been interpreted in different ways. And I'm focusing on, on uh, scholarly hypertext and especially uh, historiographical hypertext. Because hypertext has also largely been applied in interactive literature or hyperfiction, fictional literature. Um, um, note-taking and note management uh, in digital settle custom. Uh, the Bielefeld is the right place to talk about that, but I, I fear I don't have time in this talk. Um, David Kolb has addressed scholarly hypertext as a means that can represent by its own structure, with its own um, interlinked structure, a way of commenting on itself. So hypertext as being this interlinked structure comments on its own intricacy, complexity, you could say. And if it wants to do this successfully, it has to find ways how to emphasize certain parts of this network-like structure and to, to bring these parts into a relevant relationship. Postmodernism has also been an area of, um, uh, of application for that. And um, in my book, I, I draw a lot from Jakob Kramrich, who beautifully um, portrays hypertext um, in technical terms, in conceptual terms. But he has a different point of uh, venture for making hyper or for arguing for hypertext as a means of. Um, um, or as a tool for historians to, to demonstrate history. And his uh, point of venture is postmodernism. He argues that we live in a postmodern world um, without stable uh, identities, without stable structures also of knowledge uh, production. And hypertext could be a good way to mimic that, to represent this. Um, complexity in postmodern societies. So what he does is um, stressing the, the notion of modest two of knowledge production, meaning that flexible teams of different institutions come together, work together and create, um, for instance, historiography. And this collaboratory um, endeavor would be reflected in this complex structure of hypertext. Also, the complicated landscape of academic discourse uh, could be reflected by hypertext. 
meaning that different contributions, different histories find their entry into the uh, sort of meta hypertext, right? So uh, that could be connected and explored by users, um, um, which of course stresses the notion of multi-perspectivity in academic discourse. So this is how he interprets uh, postmodernity. There have been, uh, and, and Kramich does that also, um, um, have been uh, predecessors of modern digital hypertext, of course. And a famous example, uh, which also Kramerich mentions, is Fernand Brodel with his uh, Mediterranean history um, um, for the time of King Philip II, um, meaning that Brodel writes three volumes on this time of the Mediterranean uh, during the reign of Philip II, uh, stressing different time layers. Right? So he writes three volumes, but these are, all, these are volumes that employ a history of that time in their own right, but they, of course, are also interconnected to each other. And this is uh, what has been interpreted as an uh, analog hypertext. Yeah. So the idea or the, the motivation for this kind of information or knowledge architecture, you could say, has been out there before <coughs> the digital. Um, George Lando has uh, been the prime figure, I would say, for uh, uh, post-structuralist interpretation of hypertext, meaning that hypertext would be the ideal um, medium to, to employ what what uh, intertextuality wants to do, namely to connect all the pieces of writings in, in a big system of electronic uh, writings. And we can uh, probe into that deeper uh, during our discussion because uh, uh, Lando has also been um, called uh, uh, a digital Darida and uh, we can discuss the potential for hypertext or this kind of knowledge and uh, information architecture to, um, to uh, implement what uh, deconstructivism has been promising. Uh, we have examples from early digital history. Uh, Robert Darden has uh, written about the future of the book, uh, or a new age of the book, meaning that uh, we have uh, an e-book, sort of an e-book that uh, works in the first layer like, like a traditional monography, uh, descriptive account and an argumentation uh, about a historical um, topic. Um, then it has layers that go into deeper into side aspects or, um, or deeper into specific a aspects that uh, are relevant for the discussion of, the, of this topic. A layer for educational uh, training and so on. So different layers of um, um, sense making and discussion that find uh, entry into this ebook uh, design. Um, William Thomas and Ed Ayers have been famously working on uh, the history of slavery in the American Civil War, uh, the Valley of the Shadows uh, project, and uh, the project. Um, or the online hypertext, the differences slavery made probe into this entangled phenomenon of slavery uh, and, and uh, the meaning for slavery in the North and in the, in the South. And they want to, um, want to give interpretations that do not work on a single plane of interpretation, but uh, that work by multi linear uh, exploration of this <coughs> complex phenomenon slavery. Right? And their idea is to give the users an opportunity to follow this, these, these non-linear motions of sense-making for slavery. And, and I just will briefly refer to that, in recent digital history we have seen a lot of publishing editions, monographies, um, the Andrew Mellon Foundation has recently uh, funded a lot of uh, these initiatives. The Brown 
a university's library has been productive and, and highly active in this uh, endeavor. Um, um, for digital editions, uh, for teaching uh, websites, uh, David Ambrose and Kate McDonald, for instance, uh, on modern East Asian history and um, taking this notion of spatial history, space as a category in a geographical sense on the one side, but also as a conceptual term on the other side, meaning that places are attributed with meaning by different historical actors, by us today as scholars, and this has to be reflected in this hypertextual intricate design of, of their website, Bodies and Structures 2.0. And uh, tools have been created, Omika by the Roy Rosenzweig Center of History and Digital, uh, of uh, Roy Rosenzweig Center of History and New Media, um, um, Scalar to enable for this kind of online writing. Uh, and Lastly, uh, I would like to refer to Shazad Bashir's uh, recent publication on um, new visions for the pasts and futures of Islamic, uh, of, of, of the Islam. Um, um, he, he presents in an online hypertext different perspectives uh, for sense making of the Islam by, uh, by, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim uh, actors that he presents in this multivocal and uh, uh, intricate website that works by branching and uh, um, browsing by the user. So, and, if, and the last example would be the Journal of Digital History, a periodical uh, founded in uh, 2021, uh, which is a, a new platform for um, data-driven uh, research in history, um, presenting three layers of, um, of publishing. The first one is a traditional account demonstration in a narrative layer. The second one is methodological discussion in a, a methodological or hermeneutic layer. And the third one is the data layer where data is published uh, alongside with these two other layers. And you can, um, you can uh, place them in front of the display um, whenever you like. So these are different attempts to, to hypertext and to, to implement this idea of uh, multi-perspectivity. And um, my basic intervention is that we have to make sure what is to be presented or represented here. And these are different things. Um, in the case of Shahzad Bashir's uh, monography, for instance, is the multivocality, the multiple perspectives on Islam that is to be represented here in this online publication. In the case of the Journal of Digital History, it's the three layers of data, methodological discussion, and um, a narrative account on, on what you want to discuss in, in, the, in this article, in an article. And, uh, for, um, for Brodel, it's the three time layers, actually, that are to, to be presented in this unconventional way for his times. Um, my focus um, is on the arguments and narratives that we create and that have to be presented in a transparent and explicit fashion. And this means interpreting this, this, uh, this motto of this uh, whole book, knowledge design that finds its uh, translation in an appropriate uh, media de design means to give insight into the motions and the structure of narrative and argumentative uh, construction, actually. But is this only a matter of media education? Is it more, um, is it from a didactical standpoint, uh, is it uh, easier to understand if we are presented with a hypertext instead of a written account in a, 
in a traditional linear text? Or what is the benefit or what could be the benefit of uh, hypertext? And my argument would be that um, hypertext theory has um, not sufficiently um, answered this, this question. And a second intervention would be that this intuitive argument that, well, a hypertext by its own design of branching and turning is adequate because it mimics the notion of complex history, um, history that intends to stress multivocality is not enough to explain what is actually the reason for hypertext being able to do so. So what I'm asking in my book is what are the semiotic um, features of hypertext that makes it adequate? And the other question would be what are the epistemic implications to that? And to underpin this, Theoretically, I operationalize um, non-dualistic constructivism as um, uh, Josef Mitterer especially and uh, Siegfried uh, Schmidt have uh, stressed. So both of them do not address the question if there is an ontological, uh, ontologically given past, ontological realism that we have to depict in our publications um, but they say it makes no sense to talk about that. What we actually, what is important is what we do when we create meaning and create knowledge. Um, to be sure, both have uh, have rejected the, the the term constructivism, but in this. Um, conceptual sense and in this operational sense, I would like to keep it because what I want to stress is how our narratives and arguments in historiography are, um, actually constructed. What is the architecture, figuratively speaking, of narratives and argumentation? And my intuition is that we can depict by hypertext the logical and narrative architecture um, that we create when writing history, when making sense of history. <coughs> and this finds a second uh, underpinning, uh, in my view, which is logical atomism. So the, the figure of units of information that are not by themselves meaningful, but only in connection to others in, in a coherent narrative argumentation, um, is a question of how are these information, how are this, these chunks of information connected logically? How do we create propositions, sentences, narratives that are coherent and that are meaningful only in this uh, construction. <clears throat> and finally, this is another um, thesis that I um, argue for in this book, is that only visualization gives this a uh, semiotic value um, of its own. Because by visu visualizing uh, hypertext, the hypertext structure in this way, in this schematic depicted way, we depict the architecture of knowledge construction in an um, explicit way, in a way that gives us overview of the whole uh, construction of knowledge and therefore uh, more access to, to the narrative and argumentation, uh, argumentation that we want to convey. So by the force of iconicity, as Charles Sanders Peirce puts it, 
um, um, resemblance, the, the graph-like structure that I just showed to you resembles the logical and narrative structure of historiographical work is what makes the visualization so powerful. At the same time, the visualization by itself does not speak to us. We have to zoom into the notes, find uh, the information that is uh, written there, and navigate through the, the network or the branching uh, trails along the hypertext structure to find meaning and find coherence. And this is the multimodal aspect of hypertext, the combination of overview by visualization and narrative navigation by the textual features of hypertext. And yeah, this is the very last uh, uh, remark I would like uh, to, to, to add here, uh, which has not uh, uh, been part of the book yet, uh, but uh, has not been part of the book, but which uh, uh, could be uh, uh, a point of discussion for us or the broader discussion. Um, in digital history, we talk a lot about modeling, meaning that the concepts we want to find out have to be modeled first. The data that we want to find has, has to be structured. Metadata has to be uh, uh, created. Um, corpora have to be compiled in order to have meaningful collections of material that we analyze. Uh, quantitative analyses and also qualitative analyses. So modeling is, uh, in, a, in this very broad sense, uh, essential for digital history and applying digital methods. And hypertext could also be uh, a good way to conceptualize this, these connections that we make when modeling uh, information and data. So this uh, would be the outline of uh, my thoughts on hypertext and uh, digital history, and I'm looking forward to your remarks. Yeah, so that, that was great. There's, there's a lot. Um, uh, too much for the time. Uh, maybe first I'll start by thanking Lisa for inviting me and putting this all together and Alice for all of the behind the scenes work that's so important and mostly uh, Christian for the book and also that was I think a really um, great overview uh, and there's as you can tell there are a lot of things going on. One thing I do want to point out which I found very interesting is the, um, the schematic to represent the book uh, doesn't actually represent the order of the book, if you look at the table mm. of contents. We actually start over here uh, dealing with questions of, of epistemology and then semiotics. So it actually is almost entirely backwards, <laughs> the way you've, you've set it up there. And I'm not sure whether that's a translation between the, uh, the analog and the digital, uh, but there's something going on, and hopefully we'll, we'll press into it. The other thing I want to say to start is Lisa set up the domino talk structure is bringing in an expert i'd say expert on guillemet because uh, i don't i don't know that i would call myself an, an expert on digital history i'm certainly not an expert on media theory uh, and uh, much of this are things i would say that i'm deeply interested in as opposed to uh, expert um, but on the other hand i've been thinking about digital history for I guess I'm old, a long time now. I'm not unfamiliar with the territory. Over a decade ago, when I was director of the Center for the Humanities at Wesleyan, we had a digital history initiative, and that mostly involved me overseeing other people's projects um, uh, in the digital humanities, in including history. Uh, though I also then, during that time, taught a number of seminars on it using Omika, using Scalar, using Twitter at the time, a very weird thing to do in a seminar. Um, and so, so I had a lot of hands-on exposure. Uh, and then in my book, Haunting History, I devoted a chapter uh, to the restrictions of analog publishing, which I think is akin to what Christian refers to as, as druk text and linear narrative in his book, and that we, we both see um, uh, the ways this is a, a confining. And in, I think you described it pretty well as well as the potentials that you could see by shifting to new modes of narrative 
and form, which certainly includes hypertext, multivocal or multimodal texts, and multiple narratives. So I'll, I'll return to this uh, in a more explicit conversation with the book. Uh, I also have a quixotic project I've been working on for years, which is called An Intellectual History of Forking Paths, which is a hypertext intellectual history that uh, runs on a, 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 a logic. I, I don't know if it's like the multimodal, but I'll leave that aside because that's just all about me and unfinished business. Most recently, History and Theory published a theme issue in December uh, on the topic of digital history and theory to which Christian uh, contributed. And actually, we're going to be holding a, an event at Brown University through Brown University Library uh, on March 3rd and 4th with the contributors. And I just let Christian know before this that he is one of the contributors and he will be participating whether he wants to or not. Uh, but this is all to say that digital history has been on my mind, is on my mind. Uh, and it was really a, a great pleasure to read Christian's book. Uh, and I'm, I'm equally uh, uh, invested in the conversation. So, so the book, is, as you can tell, works on a number of levels. And I think it's a testament to Christian's scholarship that some are really useful beyond um, uh, one's uh, specific interest in the realm of digital history or, or hypertext. Uh, and here I'll confess that I, I did read uh, one review that was in German of, of, of Christian's book. I probably shouldn't have. I don't know if you're supposed to do that for this sort of talk. Mm -hmm. um, I found two criticisms there with which I, I, I really fundamentally disagreed. One uh, is that the book is not appropriate for a general audience because of its technical discussion. And the other was that Christian spent too much time on theoretical discussion of historical epistemology and media theory. Uh, in regard to this second criticism, I actually think that the um, opening chapters on epistemology are really essential to the intervention Christian wants to make in regard to hypertext uh, and the fruitful possibility of multiple and multivocal narratives. Um, but also, they, it really sets up the, the later argument. Beyond this, though, it really is, in a general sense, um, a, a, a really toward a force of an overview of the epistemological issues of historical representation. Uh, that have been uh, that the discipline has been grappling with for the last 40 or maybe 50 years. Um, uh, so it, it it really takes on these questions of uh, both what well, well whether we really understand the nature of the past, but more importantly our ability to represent it. Um, and, and this certainly opens the space in which what he describes as his plea for hypertext or the more robust implementation of digital history takes place. But I think it also uh, stands on a, an excellent account of those arguments uh, on its own. It does great work there. And I think similarly, the, the chapter on media theory really does great work introducing the key theoretical applications and models to someone less versed in those studies like myself, uh, while also bringing it into conversation with the questions of historical writing and representation. I think that applies to both analog and digital practice. So, it really, that chapter was a really good uh, primer or introduction to someone like me uh, who, who had, uh, you know, awareness but really was able to, to pick up uh, some of the really important aspects. I also just want to say in regard to that first point about the general audience, and I may be the wrong person since I have a different sense of who a general reading public is and their level of sophistication, um, but, but I do think Christian's book operates incredibly well also as an intellectual history of hypertext uh, and of the digital medium. And the, you got a taste of that in his conversation because you get a, an account of not only how hypertext works, uh, the semiotic uh, nature of the connection, uh, but also how it came to prominence through these figures like Vannevar Bush, uh, Douglas Engelbart, and Theodore Nelson, among others. So you. You, you, you learn a lot in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think that's, uh, I mean, it really is a, a testament to the, the way the book is put together. Now, that being said, we all know it wouldn't be a very good conversation if all I did was focus on points of agreement. So in what follows, I'd like to address uh, four issues, the first two in greater detail, the last two more quickly uh, to, to, to flesh it out. And this is what I would say is a kind of gentle or I don't know, I'm from Christian side, maybe a not so gentle provocation. 
to, to draw him out uh, from some of the explicit arguments in the book because, to be completely frank with all of you, I actually think there's um, something more radical going on in this book than Christian lets on, and that actually might push us more to this uh, unguarded version of hypertext that we saw on one side as opposed to the multimodal one, which had a lot more um, uh, narrative guardrails, but we can talk about this. Uh, so, how to put this uh, gently. The connecting thematic of my remarks to follow are that Christians framing arguments as one sort of thing, uh, but I believe the content and the examples of the book is, is more audacious than the framing argument. And I'll try to sketch this out by following four areas. Uh, one, uh, I'll call extension or expansion versus change. The next, the role and place of, of Josef Mitscherer's non-dualism mm -hmm. in Christian's book and argument. Some questions about his case studies. And then what I, I think what he sort of intimated at the end of his, his portion, a discussion of what I'll call digital 1.0 versus digital 2.0. And hopefully that will become clear. So in the book, the, the explicit... Uh, uh, claim or plea uh, the Christian makes is for hypertextual historiography uh, that we, it really needs to be implemented in the field of history, but he does so with a fairly strong caveat, and that's that the implementation of hyper, imp, implementation, implementation, my English isn't so good today, <laughs> the implementation of hypertext should be seen as an extension or an expansion of traditional historical narrative strategies and not a replacement of linear historical strategies. So in doing so, one of the things um, uh, Christian's doing to my mind is distinguishing his views from those of uh, Jakob Kramertisch, who argues that the implementation of multimodal hypertext requires a, a postmodern uh, theory of history uh, what one would immediately, based on your models, think of someone like Deleuze or Baudrillard. You know, I'm, I'm not uh, incredibly well familiar with, with Kramer Tisch's uh, book or argument. I don't think I agree with his sense of postmodernity, post our time of, as one of postmodernity of increasing complexity. I don't think things are any more or less complex than they've ever been. Uh, but uh, Kramer Tisch certainly does serve as a kind of foil throughout uh, Christian study, his work coming up uh, uh, repeatedly so that uh, uh, Christian can, can push against it. Now, in my book, in Haunting History, in the chapter called The Analog Ceiling, um, I do think this aligns with Christian's diagnosis, as I said, of the limits of analog publishing. Um, a difference is that I argue that these analog practices really force one into the sorts of linear narratives used in conventional history, which then reinforces a theory of history uh, that conforms uh, to those uh, narrative constraints, those analog constraints, and that's what I call ontological realism. Um, I, I don't know that we agree on that, although some of your remarks at the end made me think there's a, more of a convergence than I thought in reading the book. Uh, I'd say our, our agreement continues, however, in regard to the fruitful possibilities of digital and nonlinear strategies for the writing of history, which in a turn allow for multiple, multivocal, or multimodal narratives, although I'm, I'm, I'm less convinced that multimodal is the way I'd want to go. Uh, and I think this actually aligns uh, with what I've called a theory of history poly polyphonic, which is actually in a piece that I wrote for the, the History at Work blog and, and elsewhere. So I think there's a, a good deal of agreement uh, between some of the things I've written about print media, analog publishing, druk text, and that of Christian, although uh, I'd say that you can correct me if I'm, I'm misguided or in the places I'm misguided. So the place where we seem to diverge, to my mind, is in regard to whether the implementation of digital practices uh, should be the impetus for a radical change in how we think about history mm. uh, as a discipline and practice, as opposed to an extension or an expansion of the previous models. 
Uh, and here, I can't really say how Cramer Tisch fits into this, uh, or even to know whether I agree with him or not, but certainly my commitments tend toward the postmodern, or at least to deconstruction. Uh, and it's my view uh, that a change in our understanding of history is inevitable, certainly given the circumstances of the way we're now taking it up and writing about it. Um, in Christian's book, it's clear that he doesn't want to replace conventional history, at least not explicitly, uh, but to encourage the use of alternative tools and modes for this nonlinear construction of historical work. And I'd, so that seems to be a, a difference in at least the way we're putting ourselves forward. But here's also where I hit upon my first question or conundrum or confrontation. So this is a point to which I hope uh, you'll respond. Um, in the book, Christian speaks of a blind spot. And I think I may have detected uh, one of Christian's own, uh, at least on my reading. Because in reading the book, it strikes me that the analysis and prescriptions offered are more radical than the argument they serve. Digital hypertext is promoted as the means to achieve nonlinear, multiple histories that engage the reader as much as the author in pursuit of complex historical constructions, whereas in the book, linear or classic sender-receiver models are not only questioned, but repeatedly shown to be inadequate for the sorts of complex undertakings that uh, uh, Christian's interested in, and at least to my mind, have always been the case uh, in the way uh, history occurs. So while much of what Christian offers is couched in this language of extension or expansion, I'm not sure which the, is the better translation. It might change depending. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but actually calls for us to do a, a wholesale reconceptualization. Uh, and I think so you, you kind of have this, uh, these statements on the one hand about expansion, but the work really makes us need to rethink. Um, so one question that comes from this is about what, what, what does the implementation of hypertextual strategies actually do to the narrative and then what this then does to those conventional um, histories and theories thereof. This is to say once that genie is out of the bottle, can you go back to the traditional linear narrative or is that just uh, 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 always thereafter problematized by the very uh, complexity of the constructions. Now, I mean, maybe maybe Brodel tells us something about that, but I'm not sure. I think this is actually different than what's going on in, in Brodel in, in, in practice. Because it strikes me there's a knock-on effect and perhaps even a, a tipping point if the sorts of changes you call for for the book are actually enacted. And, and one of the things Christian talks about is there are lots of practical obstacles as to why they haven't been. I'd say these are all analog ceiling aspects having to do with cost, citation, tenure review, the, all these sort of institutional things. But unfettered, if we actually could do what we actually can do technologically now, mm. is there a tipping point? Uh, now, it may be uh, that I'm reading into Christian's book what I want to find. I often do that. Uh, but one place where the tension between rapprochement and revision uh, comes to a head is not in my definition of the blind spot, but actually in Christian's own definition. Uh, because when I first read the book, I took this blind spot to be the inadequacies that <coughs> result from traditional linear history, which necessarily reduce the complexity and multiplicity of the past into a singular uh, explanation, uh, and uh, rendering the multiplicity, which always is already there, uh, uh, invisible or unannounced. Um, and so that's how I read the blind spot in sort of my first uh, taking, that that like, well, if, if there's a blind spot for, for historians, the blind spot has to do with the way that the dominant trends in, in monography uh, actually disallow the kind of multiplicity that Christian finds so important. But at other times, <clears throat> the blind spot seemed more modest really restricted to the ability to determine which media is best suited to which form of knowledge investigation. So, so I would like to hear your thoughts on each, which seems right to you. 
and whether the two understandings can be held at the same time or whether the one is going to sort of uh, uh, blow up the other. But this issue of change versus extension or expansion leads me to my second point of engagement regarding the philosophy of Josef Mitterer, which is another place where I find the content or perhaps the ramifications uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the framework to be more radical than the explicit argument. So in the early sections of the book, Christian works through narrative strategies of representation, and I'd say you could place um, uh, them under sort of two competing claims. First, the correspondence theory of representation, where the reality of the past event is supposed to coincide with the representation of that event. Uh, and then the second one is radical constructivism, where the construction of the event in the present dictates the properties of that event in the past. Um, I think in the conclusion, you have a more modified duality marked by the work of Droysen on the one hand, and then Ricoeur and Certeau and, and White uh, on the other hand. Uh, but the point is that uh, Christian finds both of these models inadequate to his task uh, or problematic for his task, and thus opts for the non-dualism, or as he calls it, the non-dualist uh, constructivism of uh, Josef Mitterer and Siegfried Schmidt. And I think at one level this makes perfect sense uh, because Christians uh, ultimately interested in questions of narrative or aesthetic construction rather than issues of epistemology or ontology per se. Uh, the non-dualistic constructivism enables him to discuss the construction of history or historical narratives and analyze different and differing strategies of representation without entering into debates about the truth status of those representations or the status of the past. It also allows Christian to work on this constructivist platform without necessarily subscribing to the uh, epistemological or ontological commitments that radical constructivism entails. So uh, ideally, on this model, the conclusions Christian draws from his analysis should be applicable regardless of one's particular uh, philosophical commitments. Whether you're a realist or a constructivist, these are tabled and we're really focusing on the representation side. Now, I, I, I wonder whether this really holds up given uh, uh, his conclusions. This is to say whether, whether these issues are really tabled. Um, uh, this is to say that Christian deploys this non-dualistic constructivism in the service of a praxis-oriented investigation where questions of plausibility and adequacy are paramount. And this is uh, uh, stated explicitly on, I think, on page 57, but it, it's repeated as as the kind of um, cordon sanitaire, the, 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 the guardrails in which the argument is, is made. Uh, so in doing this, though, Christian is able to simply avoid these epistemological and or ontological problems about the status of the past by keeping the focus on practical applications, specifically the practical application of hypertext for the writing of history. Uh, the issue is the coherence of the design and media rather than the relation between historical representation and reality. Those two things are, are put aside. But this does leave a, a big question uh, to be answered, and that's whether Christian is fully committed to Mitterer's non-dualistic model. Um, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on Mitterer, far from it, but as I understand it, the power of his account is that he just does away with the correspondence between the thing represented and the representation of that thing. Uh, Mitterer's basic argument is that the description of an object and the object under description are the same. Now, there is a, a weaker variant of the argument, uh, and that's that um, Mitterer does not want to deny or overcome the distinctions between language and reality, word and object, between what we talk about and, well, what we talk and what we talk about. But he's rather interested in when, how, and why these distinctions are introduced into our discourse. And that, I, I would say, is probably the, 
the, the, the mode that, that Christian's working with. The strong version of this position, however, does, and even I think the weaker one actually entails this commitment to a certain point, well, actually ultimately does, is that the, the correspondence of reality to representation is simply a faulty dualism, and that the solution is an understanding uh, that relies solely on descriptions uh, and in which it is the description which changes the object described. The object becomes whatever the description is. So, uh, you know, to be fair, I, I understand the utility of cutting off this intractical problem of correspondence in order to focus entirely on which media are most appropriate to which cases as a means of description. And certainly this non-dualistic constructionism allows you to do it. So it makes sense for the book. But, but the question remains as to whether you share Mitterer's more radical commitments to non-dualism. And I ask this because if so, uh, then we aren't really avoiding the epistemological or ontological issues or the debate between realism and constructivism, but committing to a third way where any difference between representation and the thing represented is simply dismissed. Uh, you are moving away from those two models you set up and moving to a different epistemological model. Uh, and uh, it's fascinating position, uh, but it's also a very controversial one and one that has ramifications on what history or certainly the past is. Uh, I mean, under such an understanding, does it matter whether the representation is digital or analog? Or is it that you see this as a means to distinguish between the different descriptors, analog versus digital, and what they do to the past? This is to say the object described. And how would this then align with your own assessment of what you call in the conclusion the special epistemological status of the past? I mean, how in this non-dualistic model does the past take on any kind of special epistemological status, given that it simply would be a, a variant of whatever is being described in the present? If the descriptions all take place in the present or a future present, what, if anything, could be different about the past? Um, and the next question, of course, is whether the dualism that Mitterer is so keen to remove isn't reintroduced once you commit to something like a special nature of the past event, mm -hmm. which places pressure on the ability to adjudicate whether it has been adequately represented, and that is an important mm -hmm. part of your argument. Mm -hmm. Is the media adequate to the representation? Does that then just put us back in this other model mm -hmm. to which I think Mitterer would find, would find highly problematic? And on this line, which I maybe I'm going on too much, but I find it fascinating. I wonder how you would reconcile your argument to that of Mateos uh, Fafinki's claim that digital facsimiles, digital work, are actually, and here I'm quoting him, entities separate from the sources they aim to represent. The very creation of a digital facsimile is a complex process of remediation, end quote, which is to say that in digital production, the object changes so as to create two distinct and different objects. A facsimile mm -hmm. is not a representation, but something totally different, involving a whole different set of properties yeah. uh, and commitments, uh, as does the digital writing you describe. How does this metamorphosis fit with your theoretical scaffold? And I guess the last thing I'd say is, um, despite the olive leaf to uh, traditional historians, Non-dualism is an epistemological model to which most conventional historians do not subscribe. And in this sense, your argument about hypertext as an extension or expansion of conventional linear history doesn't really align with the epistemological framework that you use to adjudicate the very modes of representation. Or I'd, I would, I'd be, it'd be interesting to see how, how it would be received uh, once the curtain was revealed. I mean, mm -hmm. if it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so that, those are my long comments. I, I, I want to say just a few things about uh, the case studies and then this 1.02.0. Because if we turn to the case studies that Christian discusses, uh, I think these do work very well for the argument that digital history in general and hypertext in particular are an extension or expansion, not a replacement of historical uh, existing historical conventions. 
But one could argue that this is because these examples are all quite adventurous in using <coughs> available digital technology, but really quite modest in terms of methodological or theoretical innovation. You know, it's also the case that many of the examples uh, presented by Christian, certainly the Victorian Web, the Valley of the Shadow, Florida Memory, are all quite early examples of hypertext. Uh, they've been built out since then, mm -hmm. uh, but they still really hold, I mean, when you look at them, they do look a little creaky because uh, they were built up at a very early time and the jumping about isn't quite so flashy like Sh uh, Shazad's book, which, you know, sort of has this seamless, uh, 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 multiple interactive sense, so the, the, the touch and feel is much better. Uh, but it, I think it's also the case that these early examples are, are much more like archives or repositories. Yes, you can have multiple ways of going through them, uh, but I'd say they're less like the multimodal history that, um, that, that, that you advance. Uh, and so there, there is a way in which they serve one part of your argument but maybe they actually could be open for a contestation for another side of your argument. And so the, the, the last bit that I, that I want to talk about is this history 1.0, 2.0. And I, I have to say that, so this I've, I've stolen, cribbed, plagiarized. I owe total uh, uh, debt to Stefan Tanaka in this article that he wrote for the history and theory theme issue. Uh, but in it, he offers this wonderful uh, example of an ad, I think it was an advertisement uh, from the 1950s. And it's about the house of the future. And he uses this as an analogy to the sorts of projects, the case studies Christian discusses. And so it's a picture and it's an image of a housewife cleaning the house of the future by washing mm. everything with a hose. Everything can be washed with a hose. You can be done with all of your housework in 10 minutes in the house of the future. So uh, this depicts the possibility of technological innovation, uh, but it turns out the innovation maintains the existing hierarchical structures. The miracle of modern materials makes housework easy. The woman is still a housewife. Similarly, the technological innovations allow the historian to do many things with greater ease, but in many of these examples, the historian is still quite a conventional historian. Uh, in Tanaka's words, <clears throat> the ubiquity of digital media and the centuries-long acceptance of technology itself as improvement has obscured our ability to see technology's tendency to also maintain a status quo, end quote. So again, it's not that I think one necessarily need follow something like Kramer Tisch's call for a postmodern network, though I guess, you know, I am postmodern in my leanings, and this is my conclusion in Haunting History, where I argue deconstruction is particularly well suited to the sorts of things you discuss. Uh, but that the existence of digital scholarship and hypertextual possibilities are already changing what history is even if they're being constrained by what I call the analog ceiling, the assumption that the person doing it and the way they're doing it is going to be the same, even though it's done with greater ease. You can use the hose. And I, I wonder whether there isn't more daylight between the sorts of multiple complex narratives you propose as history writing, multivocal, uh, polyphonic structures you offer, and the database is presented in the majority of the cases, case studies. And I, I don't think these live up to the sophistication or potential offered in either your discussion of plot or narrative in the book, uh, which I find actually would ask these very <coughs> websites to do different uh, things to, to achieve the kind of ends that, that, I, that you intimate, or at least that might be the logical extension of the argument. So I'll, I'll conclude with the because I, 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 now that I'm listening to myself, I feel like this has been a grilling. I don't want it to be that. I just think there's enormous potential in the book, and I want to hear about it. Uh, and I'm going to conclude in hopefully a slightly more playful way uh, by asking you to range out a little from the confines of the book to think about where hypertext and digital history can take us, to return to Stefan Tanaka. Um, uh, on his account, the emphasis on hypertext and the sorts of case studies discussed are really belong to what he calls history, digital history 1.0 where the emphasis was on building up the technology and applying it to web ultimately to web-based applications, such as online databases 
and these early hypertextual ebooks or publications. Uh, but Stefan also references what he calls Digital History 2.0, which emphasizes new argumentative forms. And here we encounter different assumptions about what an archive is and how it works, the way it's built and accessed, different assumptions about the author, whether in collaborative, collaborative endeavors between designers and scholars like Shazad's book, or uh, between multiple authors, or where the, quote, author is actually working with ready-made programs or platforms that are, in a sense, pre-authored. And I think Omeka and Scalar would be examples of this, where what you do is innovative to extent, but only as innovative as the, the, the work that the people already did in deci deciding how your narrative can come out. Um, but we might also think of new forms of historical engagement and argument via image, sound, or as video games. Uh, increasingly, uh, the public is getting their history not from this kind of text, but from YouTube videos and from video games. And there's been, been some interesting surveys about what those numbers are. They're, they're quite staggering. And finally, I, I'm really curious what you think about arguments produced entirely digitally by digital or artificial intelligence, such as those by the chatbots, which are causing such panic among teachers of history right now. <laughs> and, and you touch on some of these possibilities in your book, but I wonder if you can reflect on how the development of digital history 2.0 impacts this argument about hypertext. Because as you suggested, there is a relation and a utility in holding on to the hypertext. Um, I, I'm actually especially interested in whether it might lead you to consider a greater epistemological shift in our understanding of what history is and historical authors are. Uh, and here again, I think this is a logical, ex logical extension of your work in the book. And the last thing that I'm really curious about is how you think the book might have been different had it been written <laughs> entirely in a digital mode, and specifically for the mode in the mode for which you advocate in, in your own, in your Druk text, in your, in your monograph. Would this have been preferable? Are there things you could have achieved had the book been digital that you couldn't in the analog form? And are there aspects that would have been lost in yeah. a digital format? Are there things that we're going to give up? Yeah. Would the argument have changed? Um, and then finally, I just want to thank you again for, you know, the, I had a lot to say, but it's because I, I found so much in this book. It was um, incredibly insightful, incredibly uh, in challenging, and I'm really eager to hear the, 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 the responses or non-responses to, 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 to what the, the too much that I just said. So thank, thank you for you. that. Thank you. So I would say before we open the discussion, I give you the <laughs> provoking questions. Yeah. How do we do that? Should I pick some of them? We got yeah, pick what you or? want. Yeah, <laughs> but thank you very much. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. These were um, great uh, <coughs> points that you addressed, and I hope to to uh, answer to the to them in in, in in a way that picks up most of the aspects that you touched on. Um, and I maybe start with uh, the last one. Um, actually, I have a remark. Uh, on, on the issue that I haven't created a hypertext here, but a traditional uh, monography. And I think um, this connects to your first questions is, um, this makes sense for the purpose that I, um, I try to, to um, uh, follow here in, in this book. And that means um, I wanted to systematically um, address the issue of how can hypertext, or what is hypertext, and what can, how can it help us to extend the means of historiography as a tool for um, the writing of history. And I think this is uh, this this is a line of argumentation that I want to to present in this book. I don't want to uh, present a multivocal um, demonstration on how to think about digital media and history and which digital media we could apply here, but to give a 
need argumentation. And this is also why I uh, structured the, the, the slide uh, as I have done it, because this is form follows function for me. Mm. And this was uh, one of my first um, working titles actually for the, for the whole book, Form Follows Function. And um, the second reason why I've written a monography and not a hypertext is that uh, the regulators from my home <laughs> university <laughs> See, I thought that, that might be the case. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, only, only practical issues here. No, but uh, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm that modest uh, as you characterize me. Uh, and this has to do uh, with this motto, motto of uh, form follows function because I have a deeply instrumental understanding of the media or means in general that we use to write history. So what I'm not keen to follow is a media-centric view. I don't want to uh, look, well, which media ha do we have? Which media, digital media, do we have now? And what does that open <coughs> for historiography? And how can that change uh, historiography? Um, I think it's, it's highly worthwhile, and uh, there are similar discussions in applying digital analytic methods in digital history and digital humanities. It's worthwhile to explore the potentials of new technology and to experiment a bit, in, in experiment in a, in a broad sense, with new technology and see how that can open up new forms of um, historiography. But I think it's, it's worthwhile to look which motivations are there by historians, actually, what can we observe? And I think the examples avant la lettre are, are this, uh, interesting to me in this respect um, and how do we find the appropriate means to to implement uh, this kind of historiography that is conceptualized and the point of venture I have here is uh, well if we think of history that is not so teleologic or uh, at least linearly organized uh, but works on time layers, for instance, or intersections and anything else that is not easily to be depicted or uh, written down in a, in a linear way. These are the examples that are interesting to me. And I think uh, I have this idea, um, I follow this, this, this basic notion that digital media or media in general, uh, like hypertext or typographical text, have to serve as tools to translate these conceptions into a form. So form follows function is, would be the, uh, the easy way to, to, to say that. Um, and of course, this is not, this is not a, a radical argument. Um, and I think it would be another question, another uh, project to, um, <coughs> to think about what that would mean for historiography in general or uh, how historiography uh, might change uh, in, in our times now. And I think this is a worthwhile uh, a thing to do, um, but, it, but it's another project, I would mm. say. I think, uh, I think it's more about what do we actually want to do and how can we do it? Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would phrase it like that. Um, and this is why I, I stress this, this, uh, this uh, picture of uh, extension or expansion so much. Um, Cramerich is a bit more um, uh, creative in, in this sense, and I think he is uh, very um, consequent also, because um, drawing from this postmodernist uh, thinking, he says, well, we have to think about new forms of um, historical sense making. And, and he actually ex extends the lists or the typology of Jörn Rüsen mm -hmm. um, and his uh, typology of uh, narrative uh, uh, models, uh, how to narrate history. And he says that, well, in postmodern times, we have to think about situative narrating, situative histories that are only valid in a, uh, in a very um, 
perspectivity-driven mm -hmm. way. And hypertext would be a good means to implement that. And, and this is, this is a, a something um, that is more radical in, in the sense that you asked for. Um, I'm, I'm not arguing um, on the grounds of po postmodern theory, but I think he is consequent in, in doing that. Mm. Um, Yeah, concerning Mitterra, maybe, um, and the non-dualist philosophy. I think I follow this uh, more moderate notion of, of, of Mitterra that you, you characterized. Because I think, um, I think the question of is there, uh, is there the past and can we, um, can we correspond to, to it uh, in our historiographical writings is a is a important question is an important question for philosophy of history and i would say at least it makes no sense to deny that doesn't mean that uh, I, I say it is like it is so but i think this is another question and uh, i think my argument in in the book is that this is a worthwhile question to to think about but um, it is another project as well mm. so i would say um, what I'm interested in is, what do we actually do? How do we construct our narratives and arguments um, structurally and logically? And how can that find its um, form in publications? And the question of how does that, how does, what, what, what are the ontological implications on that? in that is a, a highly worthwhile uh, question to ask, but it's another project as well. Well, so, I mean, just to, to push back, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I wonder why something like actor network theory mm -hmm. isn't a better, I mean, because no matter what, by using Mitterer, you're already moving into a frame mm -hmm. that is, if not anti-historical, ahistorical, because the, the representation is mm -hmm. going, it is, it's not a radical constructivism in the traditional sense, mm -hmm. at least according to Mitterer, although it is, yeah. the, the description makes the thing. Yeah. The description always makes the thing. And that's going to hold yeah. in the book for what you're doing, yeah. whereas actually the way you describe it is in terms of things yeah. being situated, things being connected, yeah. um, uh, maybe even snapping together to be the right thing yeah. at the right time. I mean, I'm just curious yeah. about that. Yeah. But so if I understood it correctly, um, Midera says, uh, all we have are descriptions so far, as he yeah. says, and these are descriptions from now on, but it makes no, it has no value to think about the ontological status of these descriptions. Uh, I mean, you could address these questions, but for the practice, and this is the praxeological mm -hmm. uh, um, aspect of it, for the practical side, it makes no difference. Um, because this is a metaphysical question, mm -hmm. which, which uh, adds up to the praxeological question. Um, so I would go with, with uh, Mitra uh, on this level, saying that um, what we deal with are descriptions of processes, uh, see, uh, Schmidt has more emphasis on the processes. Yeah, that's true. We, we are not talking about objects, but uh, what do we actually do when we talk about something like uh, truth or uh, the big ontological uh, uh, terms? Um, and that's what we do. And the question of how that what we do and the products of our doing, the, the monography or or the, the, the publications that we create are rooted in the world and uh, uh, correspond or do not correspond in the world uh, is a question that is latent there. And, but it has no effect on the doing. Mm. And this is, this is just the, 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 main, uh, the I think the, the way I interpret it and the, how I use it in, in the book. Um, yeah, that's, that's how I would phrase it. <laughs>